Uh, I just wanted to say to people who are entering now, welcome. Very nice to have you here. We're going to give it a few minutes for people to come on board, and then we'll get started. Uh, we've got a few hundred people registered, and uh, I'm hoping that we'll have a good discussion this evening. Anyway, welcome, one and all. And I should say, just to keep those interested who are waiting for the main event to start, I'm Peter Tavins. I'm the MPP for Toronto Danforth, uh, currently the interim leader of the Ontario NDP, and uh, someone with a long history on energy, environment, and climate issues. And I'm very happy to be here this evening with a really good panel of folks. I think you'll enjoy what we have to say. Thank you very much for taking time this evening to join us. Got a, a good group to give you information on what's going on with the Green Belt and what we can do about situation we're facing in Ontario right now. So good evening, everyone. The uh, the flow of participants coming in is slowed down a bit, so I think we might as well get started. I want to welcome you for being, welcome you for, wow, it's been a long day, that's all I can say. Welcome all of you for joining us this evening. Uh, this is an important issue, an important meeting, and I'm very pleased that you're able to be here. We're going to start off with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge we're hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. And I also want to add that reconciliation is more than just acknowledgement. We need to take concrete action to deal with what's, what's the situation faced by Indigenous peoples in this country in the years to come. The purpose of this meeting is to fill people in on what's going on with legislation, what's going on with the Green Belt, to hear from frontline, to hear from the public, to discuss ways that we can all push back. I wanted to update people in case they had not heard uh, that the Integrity Commissioner and the Auditor General are, have uh, stated publicly that they're going to open an investigation into the Ford government's Green Belt's action after NDP complaints. Um, our incoming leader of the NDP just said recently, I'm relieved to see this matter is being treated with the seriousness that it deserves and pleased to see this response from the Integrity Commissioner and the Auditor General. Ontarians are owed answers about the Green Belt. I'm confident that today is a step in the right direction to understanding what happened. I'm hopeful that Ontarians will be able to get answers in a thorough and timely manner because of these investigations. Tonight, you'll have a, an opportunity to hear from a panel of experts and you'll have time to express questions and concerns. I wanted to note for those who want to pose a question, make a comment, please use the Q&A function. Uh, we won't be using the raise hand features or the chat. So I'm gonna start off by introducing our panelists. Uh, they'll have a chance to speak for a few minutes and then we'll have questions and commentary by you, the participants, and then we'll have a wrap up uh, in about the last 10 minutes or so. So I'm very pleased to introduce Anaf Al-Habib. He's a student leader with Greenbelt Youth Action at Riverdale Collegiate, and one of the people who organized the school walkout uh, in late December last year, calling for action to protect the Greenbelt. Our other participant, Laura Bowman, is a lawyer from Southern Ontario, uh, from an area of an old growth maple forest surrounded by farmland. She advocates for clean water, poverty reduction, food security, good planning, and affordable housing. She's lived and worked in Quebec, British Columbia, Alberta, and Nunavut. Uh, she's, sorry, she strives to create networks and relationships and to engage directly with affected communities. Her work includes water issues, biodiversity, air quality, contaminated sites, and energy. And we have as well, Phil Pothin, uh, environmental land use planning and administrative lawyer and the Ontario Environment Program Manager with the organization Environmental Defense. Uh, using a combination of political advocacy, community legal education and strategic litigation, Phil is helping to lead the fight to protect Ontario's natural heritage and prevent runaway climate change by curbing sprawl and transforming existing car dependent post-World War II developments across the province into denser, walkable, and trans-supporting complete communities. I should also note 
Bill's an East End resident who lives just north of the Danforth near Main Square and Crescent Town. And I'm just going to go to our panelists' comments, but I do have to, again, remind you, if you have questions or comments, use the Q&A feature. And I want to tell people that there will be a rally on Monday, January 23rd at noon at 123 Queen Street West, uh, coming to show solidarity with rural Ontario municipalities who've been harmed by Ford's Bill 23 and the proposed destruction of the Greenbelt. This rally will take place outside of the Rural Ontario Municipalities Association Conference in Toronto on January 23rd at noon at 123 Queen Street West. And with that, um, Anna, I'd like to start with you. If you could just talk about what you and your fellow students did at your high school and what moved you to take action. Hello, concerned community members. My name is Anaf Al Khabib, and like Peter said, I'm a high schooler who recently organized a protest about the green belt. Now, like many of you, I'm very frustrated about what the government is doing with the green belt. The precedent that swapping protections will set is disastrous, and in a time where our first priority should be the environment, it is absolutely outrageous. I fear that if we let this stand soon all of us will find that every protection, environmental protection in Canada will be stripped or swapped. That's why we decided it's time for us to protest. Now, in the one protest we organized, we had hundreds of supporters expressing their rage alongside us. But we fit, excuse me, excuse me. But we faced one major issue that all of you can help with. We found that very few people are actually aware of the issue, but those that know of it, they're as enraged as us. When I first started organizing, <laughs> excuse me, I learned so few of my peers actually knew about what has happened and why it's important. The week before the protest, my team had to go class to class to personally speak with over 900 people to inform them of the issue. <laughs> and any action we can ever take will be hindered by the lack of awareness. That's why the best thing you can do to support the Green Belt, because all of you know how important it is, is to tell more and more people around you, to make them learn more about it, enlighten everyone around you. So with that, what I would like for all of you to do would be to follow every Green Belt movement there is, including ours, which you can find at greenbeltya.ca or on our Instagram at, at Greenbelt Youth Action. It is time for us to step up to protect the Greenbelt. We need petitions, we need funding to the right campaigns, and above all, we need knowledge. Thank you. Anna, thank you very much. Laura, I'm gonna to go to you next. Um, well, uh, you know, as I'm sure many of the participants know, we've been seeing an unprecedented uh, amount of attacks on green space in Southern Ontario over the last few years. Um, EcoJustice, the organization that I work for as a staff lawyer, um, we've worked with our clients who are typically other environmental organizations to fight back against many of these changes. Um, we brought uh, two different cases against the increasing use of ministers zoning orders to uh, override uh, wetland and woodland protections. And um, we, you know, most recently are, are assisting environmental defense with uh, a case against the Minister of Municipal Affairs um, for overturning Hamilton's decision not to expand its urban boundary into green space. And um, there's really a common theme in, in running across all of this, which is that the key rules that govern environmental decision making in Ontario are being systematically ignored or overridden. Um, I think, you know, what, what we really need to see is for people to not let this issue slide. They need to keep going to the rallies, keep following the yours to protect. Um, coalitions, messaging, um, 
and 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 don't let this slide at any level of government because they all have a role to play in pushing back against this. You know, municipalities need to assert um, need to assert what limited powers they do have to try and push back against this and push back against the uh, tax increases that are going to go along with many of these changes. Um, they do still have some control over things like servicing and that that needs to be a pinch point um, where municipalities are pushing back. We also, you know, we, we need to see continued pressure on the provincial government because there's more to come. Um, I really want to emphasize that there is no bottom to this. Um, you know, we, we, we've seen them picking away at the edges and now they are really going to the for the heart of our protections over uh, woodlands and green space. It's not gonna stop with swapping out the green belt. There, there are still other proposals on the table um, implementing the stripping of conservation authority powers, potentially getting rid of the protections for provincially significant wetlands and woodlands altogether. Um, nothing is, is you know, outside the bounds. And so the more that they see people are opposing these changes, the better chance we have of holding the line and reversing those changes in the future. Um, and, uh, you know, don't let the feds get off the hook on this either, because they do also have a role to play. They do have powers over fisheries, migratory birds, uh, environmental assessment that they can exercise to intervene and protect some of these spaces. So uh, yeah, just keep pushing back, keep going to rallies, make it uh, clear that this is a, an issue that affects your vote at all three levels of government. Okay, Laura, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to say to all of you are, who are participating this evening, uh, that if you have a question that you want to have posed, uh, if you have a comment, please put it in the Q&A. Uh, the chat is not using, not being used this evening, and uh, we can't recognize hands being put up either. So if you're a participant, your prime method of getting in touch and getting a question put forward is to put it in the Q&A. Uh, we have two or three now. Uh, it would be useful to have a number more, so we've got a good round when we go to questions and answers. I'm going to go now to Phil Pothan. Phil, if you could speak to this issue. Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone. Uh, so Laura has touched on a lot of the substantive policies that we're going to be pushing back on, that we're, we're fighting, that have got us all, have got all of you to show up here after this meeting on an evening that you could be spending uh, doing something else. Uh, and I just want to start, first of all, by framing the pattern behind all of these changes. I guess they're all attacks on the environment, they're weakening environmental protections, but what they all are focused on is accelerating sprawl and removing any uh, barriers, environmental barriers, uh, anti-corruption barriers, uh, 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 planning barriers, to development of land that has been bought up by a few key land developers on the outskirts of uh, Ontario's uh, most desirable places to live. And so uh, they have justified this based on uh, a core underlying narrative. And that is, uh, it's not about housing affordability. So I think we often get lured into uh, making this about housing affordability. The government isn't talking about how housing affordability, that's a real problem. They're not speaking to that. They're not intending to speak to that. They're speaking to the shortage of housing, the fact that there are fewer homes than there are households looking for homes. And we don't, we don't need to get into the question of whether uh, we, we adding more homes at market rate will drive down prices in order to recognize that we need more homes. So their explanation for why there is a shortage of homes is that we don't have enough farmland and natural heritage available to build on. And somehow that that 
imagined shortage of land is uh, causing there not to be enough homes. And the, our uh, message as the environmental movement is that that's simply not true. That there is a massive glut of unused land already allocated for development land that we'd like not to be used, but it's marked for development, it's farmland, it's natural heritage areas outside of GTA cities, outside of other greater Golden Horseshoe areas that's sitting unused, more than 300 square kilometers of it in the GTA age alone. And that's sitting unused and it's continuing to be unused and adding more unused land to that pot of unused land that we've been sitting on for years is not going to add more home. And this is the key thing. The environmental movement's message is that the barrier to adding more homes, apart from the lack of government investment, which I'm sure I don't need to tell all of you about in actually building public and uh, affordable housing, apart from that, it is a set of rules which makes it hard or illegal to add lower cost forms of housing to existing neighborhoods and built up areas, and in particular, low density post-war summer. So there are two conflicting narratives out there. It is, is it NIMBYism and uh, is it uh, sprawl development patterns and low densities that are the cause of the housing crisis? Or is it environmental protection that the housing is the cause of the housing crisis? We are saying that the government by forcing sprawl, by not allowing us to use growth to fix our existing low density communities and diverting that growth to new sprawl suburbs instead is doubling down on the problems that have the bad decisions that have caused our housing crisis. You cannot anymore build large houses on large lots or even small houses on large lots far away from existing centers and have them be affordable or have them be even attainable for anyone. So, the old, so this is why there's a piece even if you live in a neighborhood that's uh, built out in a place like Toronto Danforth, for you to act in your neighborhood and say, this caricature that we don't want densification in our neighborhood, that we are okay with our population declining, that it's completely false and that we actually are fully willing to do this. And the Ford government is depriving us of population growth that we need and we want in order to create a pretext for its sprawl. So the more you can show up in support and show that you are not the caricature that they're making you into, the better off you will be. Uh, and so that means that like you can talk about something in your backyard rather than something in someone else's backyard, which is obviously we all care about the green belt. Uh, so what can you do? So what can we do apart from that broad thing to stop what the government's trying to do? Uh, and so in order to understand that, I think we have to understand the government's game plan. The game plan that it's pitching to all of its members is that, uh, yes, everybody hates this. Yes, nobody believes us that we actually need this land. And, and we've checked, uh, two thirds of the population believes that our narrative of why there's a housing shortage and not the government's narrative, uh, even though they believe there's a housing shortage, they don't believe that adding more land will help in the suburbs. Uh, and so, but they don't care. They're like, well, this will blow over. Let's batten down the hatches. Let's get it done right now. And it'll all be done long before the election. That's what they're telling, you know, your backbencher MPs, this is why you should hold the line uh, and, and go along with this. And so we need to, first of all, make that not true. We have to make the pain go on and on and on and never end. And that means not accepting these decisions as final. That means we're counting on the opposition to promise to undo these decisions. We're campaigning on, we're counting on uh, people like you to demand, not just to punish and be mad that the government took this land under the green belt, but to demand that they put it back in, to demand that opposition parties commit to doing that or the government itself do that. Uh, we demand that they protect wetlands, demand that they repeal Bill 23, restore conservation authorities, uh, all of that stuff you, the more you do it and the longer you drag it out so that two years from now, we should still be talking just as much about these issues. That is what's gonna make uh, this an effective campaign. And, and the reason for that, and I'll say is that 
the government is scamming its own MPs or its own MPPs. I, I think I have heard rumors and I believe that they are true that Doug Ford intends to leave office long before the next election and leave someone else holding the bag. So what this means is that, because this is this, I think they know privately that this is not an issue that's going to go away. And so I think there's an opportunity here to impress on other PC MPPs that this is not actually something you can just get over, that this is not something politically feasible, that this is the premier trying to feather the premier's nest by making friends in useful places so that he can have a lifetime of board appointments after this, and it's going to leave the government holding the bag. So that means drag it out, keep the pressure on, talk to your friends and neighbors who live in these PC ridings or in uh, other suburban areas. And uh, I would ask you also to support our campaigns. With regards to the Roma meeting, which we're talking about and the protest, the Rural uh, Ontario Municipalities Association meeting, uh, it's, it would be very much appreciated if you could show up and I understand that those details are gonna be shared, but it's, it's very important because our expectation is the narrative is going to be, this is downtown Toronto people trying to hijack a rural meeting. So this means that you show up and you be the people power and the backup, but we're going to have, and they're going to be rural environmental activists, rural progressive activists, rural farmer organizers there. And so we'd like to cede the primacy and the platform to them and, 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 and just be part of the background, be supporters, say, you know, I'm here to support uh, rural Ontario and refer to them. Try not to hog the camera yourself or to, to hog uh, you know, the spotlight in any way. Uh, give the rural Ontarians who oppose this just as strongly as Torontonians do uh, the opportunity to tell that to rural municipal leaders. Thanks. Thank, Phil, thank you very much. Much appreciated. I want to remind all of you who are participating this evening, if you have a question or a comment, please post it in the Q&A. Uh, reminder in response to one question, the demonstration against this attack on the green belt is 12 noon, 123 Queen Street West, out front of the Sheraton Center on Monday. Uh, Bill alluded to uh, how that's going to go forward. Anyone who can make it, please do show up. I'm going to take this first question, and since I've actually had an opportunity in the past to be involved in one of these things, I'll, I'll give the first round of answer. What teeth do the two investigations, Auditor General and Integrity Commissioner, have if they find against the Government of Ontario actions regarding the selling of the Greenbelt lands? And I'll just say that when it comes to the Auditor General, uh, they can't lay any charges. But what the Auditor General has done in the past when she looked into the gas plant scandal was she showed exactly how badly the people of Ontario were being treated by the decisions that imposed a burden of a billion dollars on them. Uh, the, the Auditor General's report will have great political impact. And in fact, it was her report that led eventually to Dalton McGinty's chief of staff going to jail about all of this. So her report is going to be of great consequence. The integrity commissioner uh, cannot lay charges, but if he finds in the course of his investigation that criminal activity has taken place, he will report that to the OPP. Um, I don't know if either Laura or Phil wanted to comment further on those. I think you've covered it, uh, Peter. Okay. Um, next question I have here, is there any way to prevent the housing being built on the green belt? And I'm open to whoever would like to take that one. Phil, dive in. Well, uh, with, I'm gonna focus on stuff. I, I've been told that most of the people in this meeting are in Toronto. And so I'm gonna say the number one way we can stop this housing from being built on the green belt is to have it built in the city of Toronto instead. Uh, each and every person we accommodate in our existing neighborhoods is one less unit of demand for those homes. And if there's no one who wants to buy them, there's no one who's, uh, they're, they're not gonna build them. Number two though, is that uh, you've gotta keep the pressure on on those outlying rural municipalities to uh, 
direct their growth to their existing designated greenfield areas and their own existing neighborhoods instead. Because if they don't extend the infrastructure, if they don't uh, extend the roadways, if they don't provide the support, it's going to take. It's going to be very hard for that development to go ahead. And the third thing is, you have a federal liberal MP, and the federal government has jurisdiction that it doesn't like to talk about because it imposes obligations on them. The federal government has jurisdiction to do things like protect federally listed endangered species, to do things that are relevant to protecting uh, national parks, and the administration of the Rouge National Park has said that the biggest portion of this land carve out, the uh, Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve, it's a threat to the functioning of that park. We know that. So this means that in our mind, the federal government, when the provincial government takes the next step and tries to uh, use an MZO to push forward with this development, that the, the federal government actually has jurisdiction to say no. And it's your job as folks with the Liberal MP, especially, to, to have them on the hook and say, nope, we don't buy that this is a provincial issue, it's your issue too, and we're gonna blame you if you refuse to stop it. Because the federal government for the biggest, probably arguably the most precious chunk of this land, it could just say no, and they should. Phil, thanks for that. I'm gonna go back to Laura, uh, because in fact, what you just addressed is something that uh, we've been, given a question on, thank you, Laura, for bringing up the role of the federal government. What pathways could exist for the feds to get involved in this issue is generally they're loath to step in on areas where it could be seen as overreach into provincial affairs. Laura, do you wanna expand on this whole issue? Yes, so um, one thing I'd like to really emphasize is that the federal government has jurisdiction over fisheries, which it has basically walked completely away from in freshwater fisheries in the Great Lakes. And um, they've kind of just ceded that ground. Ontario had conservation authorities that were largely taking care of the issues that the Department of Fisheries and Oceans federally should have been taking care of. Um, and now that we are losing the conservation authorities, they don't have an excuse anymore to be completely ignoring their mandate to protect freshwater fisheries in the Great Lakes. So um, I think that's that should be a real pressure point. And it really is unacceptable the degree to which they have just completely washed their hands of their, their legal mandate under the Fisheries Act to ensure that fish habitat isn't destroyed in, in, the, in the Great Lakes area. So um, they have that role. They have a role in pollution prevention, which is very much engaged by this uh, in any area that's fish habitat. So like when we're talking about Ford opening up uh, wetlands for development um, by getting rid of the provincial planning controls, where's the federal government? The federal government is supposed to be permitting these projects, but they haven't been. So, you know, let your, let your federal MP know that you are noticing that they are not doing their job, that you're noticing that you know, the wetland in, in an area that you care about is being developed. And why isn't DFO stopping this? It's their job. So that's a big piece here that I think we, I would really like to see people be more engaged with. Um, like we know, for example, that in sprawl projects, sometimes the Department of Fisheries and Oceans federally is refusing to even review projects for permits. They don't wanna have anything to do with it, even though they are legally required to authorize them for them to go ahead. So um, that's, you know, they took all the, the freshwater fishery staff out of Ontario. There's two guys in Saskatchewan now. Um, so the, the, feds, the feds need to own some of what's about to happen here a little bit, and they need to hear that you notice that they're not doing their job. Um, they also have, as people may know, uh, jurisdiction to require uh, impact assessments federally, and they did that for the GTA West Highway. They can do that for other infrastructure projects, for servicing for these uh, developments in the Greenbelt. Um, this massive population growth is going to require uh, 
many, many, many new sewage treatment projects that will impact fish habitat, that will impact endangered species habitat, that will impact international agreements around the Great Lakes. So they have that jurisdiction too. If there's a, a species at risk critical habitat, they have jurisdiction over that. Um, if there's migratory bird habitat, they have jurisdiction over that. So many of these green spaces do engage federal jurisdiction. Um, do not let your MP tell you otherwise. Laura, thank you very much. It's pretty comprehensive. Um, I need to mention to people that a video recording of this meeting is going to be made available with links to organizations and the school group after today's event. I'm going to go to Anaf. Uh, Mr. Al Habib, what kind of turnout did you get at your school walkout? Although they can't officially protest with you, did your teachers support your actions? Did you receive any media coverage for your walkout? So we we received approximately 300 to 400 youth protesters at our event, which was organized within two weeks, primarily by my team of student leaders. Our teachers were very supportive in every way they legally can could be, but the majority of the effort was carried out completely by students. As for media coverage, one of our leaders spoke on CBC Metro Morning, the morning of the protest, and the protest was also featured on Beach Metro Community News. We also had Julie DeBruzen, our local MP and Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment, speak at our event, as well as City Councillor Paula Fletcher. And they have also publicized the event. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go to the next question. Could someone explain a bit more about the Duffin Rouge Agricultural Preserve and its relation to the Rouge National Park? Phil, did you want to take that one on? Sure. I mean, I, I can start out by saying the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve, the first part of the relationship is it immediately abuts the Rouge National Park. It's a wedge of land that is the connection between the Rouge National Park and the Duffins Creek. And so these are kind of key ecosystems. And it is this uh, sort of fine web of hedgerows and woodlots and farmland that is kind of the epitome of what the green belt is supposed to be, because it doesn't just it, it apart from being habitat in itself, it allows you know the movement of wildlife, uh, and and uh, in a very relatively hospitable matrix uh, for wildlife. So it, it, it's it's what gives the critical mass to those other pieces of uh, protected area that have uh, that are still protected. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a question here. Exactly where is that quote unquote unused land that is not part of the green belt? Would help if we get a visual representation of that land. And I don't think we're set up to actually put anything up on screen. Oh, Phil. I've got it. Hold on. What about what are you seeing here? I don't know what you can see. <laughs> a map and the yeah, white. So the map on that map, I, I think I'm gonna, uh, the red areas in that map are land that was already marked for destruction. It's unfortunate, I, don't, I hate to call it unused, but it's the simplest way to explain it in the context of development. It's actual farmland and habitat now. Uh, it was already marked for development years ago. It's been sitting there. It's available, developers could go out there and build on it if they wanted, but the only land that's actually been used between 2001 and 2008 and 19, at the end of 2019, was the tiny slivers that are in black. So this means that if we continued using land, like if we just let them build on that land at the rate they wanted to build, we'd have well over 30 years of land, even if we didn't improve our land efficiency uh, in the way that we use land, we'd have more than enough for more than 30 years, especially in Durham region, where the bulk of the land, the green belt removals are targeted. Durham region has the biggest flood of all, as you can see, just big, huge swaths of red uh, that are just ready there. And that's not counting the fact that you know, outlying parts of Toronto and 
especially these 905 municipalities, they actually have vast untapped capacity in their existing neighborhoods because most neighborhoods need around 100 people per hectare. That's like Riverdale. Riverdale is like, you know, what we use as the example. <laughs> Riverdale densities are needed in order to make a neighborhood walkable. And they're something often like a third of that density, uh, generally speaking. Uh, and so the difference between Riverdale and those neighborhood current density, that's completely untapped capacity. That is new housing that could be added even with a low rise format. Because that's why we use pictures. Your house might be in a picture that we are showing to explain what uh, those communities need to do in order to solve their housing crisis. Phil, you are a magician. Thank you, sir. I'm Where's, gonna go to the next. To, you know, stop the share. There you go. Stop the share. Um, I'll just go here. Sorry, I'm sort of swamped with questions. Um, I have here, how can we convince Conservative MPPs to oppose Bill 23 or even to walk across the aisle? Uh, others may have a comment on this, but uh, it's highly unlikely that any of them would do that unless they felt that there was a powerful enough revolt out there that they would be thrown out of office in the next election anyway. Uh, I've watched how Doug Ford operates. Uh, the slightest bit of resistance to direction leads to people being thrown out of the party. Uh, so it's unlikely they'll, they'll do it unless, unless they're very clear in their understanding they have no political future, they vote for it. So there has to be a tidal wave of public opinion that convinces them that hanging on to that sinking ship is not a good idea. Um, I'm going to go to this next question. Why didn't the provincial government not purchase the land that was supposed to be protected? It would not, it would not, I suppose, prevent this government from reneging, but we might have got notice of when the government decided to open up the land for purchase by developers. Um, Laura, Phil, would either of you like to speak to that? Yeah, it's worth noting that a big chunk of the land that is being removed actually was owned by the public. The Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve. And in order the, the the Harris government did a funny thing. It said, hey, we can allow this to be farmed and we can, you know, we, government shouldn't just be holding on to land for no reason. Uh, so what we are going to do is we're going to technically, it's only technically, we're going to move it into private hands, but we're going to have all of the development rights effectively held in trust. It's more complicated than that. That's not legally exactly what it is, but effectively held in trust for the public through an easement uh, in favor of, uh, of the public. Uh, and, and so no one will ever be able to do anything except farm on it. And since that's all we want, why not just sell off the agricultural rights and we'll just hold on to that? And the, the, the provincial government, with passage of Bill 39, yeah, Bill 39, there's so many bills, I'm losing track yeah, of the numbers. I know. Uh, it handed away. It just said, oh, well, this is, they pretended that never happened and that this is just regular privately owned land. And, and, and they just gave those development rights free of charge to the extraordinarily politically well-connected developers who, who, oh, who just really bought the agricultural rights. So we did own that land, we did buy it. <laughs> uh, and, and the trouble is that people fell for one of those, you know, those scams, which uh, are often <laughs> foisted on us. And, and this was, you know, it was in that moment where, you know, privatizing everything was seen as ideal and somehow it wouldn't, it wouldn't harm the public interest. And clearly that scheme that they used did not work. Uh, but it should, and that decision should be reversed, and they should restore those easements, and that's what we're demanding. Thank you. I'm going to go to a comment, and Laura, I'd like your thoughts on this. Very good point about the federal government. They can also be asked to say no to using federal housing accelerator funds to pay for greenbelt housing infrastructure. Um, I'm going to go to Laura first, and then Phil, if you wanted to add as well. Laura, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think the, the infrastructure piece is a really important one, at least in the short term, until we get Bill 23 repealed. 
and until we can reverse some of these decisions. Um, we need to slow down the process of these developments going forward as much as we can. Um, I'm originally from a community called East Gwilinbury, um, which has had a bunch of white belt lands, many of them approved for development for years and years, but no servicing. Um, no servicing means no building. Um, and so, uh, you know, we need to keep our eyes on the infrastructure and can keep pressuring municipalities in these areas to slow down the infrastructure planning. So, you know, the, the temptation is, as soon as these things look like they're gonna be developed, as soon as the urban boundary is expanded, you know, let's get going planning that new sewer and planning that new water and planning those new roads. But the, the development charges that would have uh, made that a lucrative proposition for these municipalities have now been clawed back or removed. So um, they've now lost that financial incentive to move forward with these things. And I think there is room to pressure them to, you know, just take their time, just take their time, look at it for a really long time. Um, no rush at all to you know getting getting shovels in the ground on these projects. So um, I think that's an that is an important piece. And if if you can pressure the feds not to provide funding for that infrastructure, then that can also be beneficial. Feds should focus their money on upgrading existing infrastructure to make it environmentally compliant, not uh, building more sprawl. Thank you, Mark Phil. Uh, a slight step. Beyond that, one of my colleagues, um, uh, Nate Wallace, is a transportation expert. And so he's put together a report. And what we're asking from the federal government is that they require, as a condition of funding, any kind of infrastructure in municipalities, but especially transit infrastructure or support for transit infrastructure, that they require municipalities uh, to enter into agreements with them that they will have policies that ensure that development patterns in those communities will support that transit, will ensure that it will be used efficiently. So what this means, and we're saying, is that they should actually, municipalities should be asked as a condition of this funding to not service these other areas, not just to not use federal, federal government money for the servicing, but not to provide the servicing at all and just not do it and let, and, uh, and, and, and not uh, not plan to direct growth to those areas. And so the, the government should actually get in there, use the, the financial influence that it has to make this development not happen. So those are beyond just not directly financing that development, getting municipalities, leaning on municipalities as a federal government, uh, not to play along with what the provincial government is doing. Bill, thank you. Uh Laura, I'm going to go to you with this question. We've got about five minutes of questions and comments left before we go to wrap up. Um, are there opportunities, oh, sorry, for court cases against the Ford government for failing to preserve the natural legacy which belongs to all Ontarians? Laura, since you're involved with one of those, I thought you'd be the best to start off that response. Yeah, well, right now we do we do have a case. We represent environmental defense uh, in trying to get the court to set aside the decision to force Hamilton to expand its urban boundary. Um, you know, there, there may well be some other opportunities, um, opportunities to get the federal government involved, opportunities to challenge servicing infrastructure. Um, I was involved in a, a opposing servicing uh, infrastructure for sewers to facilitate sprawl in East Bloomberg, and you know that project ended up being canceled after you know six years of of pushing back on it. So it can be done, um, but you know I I guess I do want to emphasize you know I'm a lawyer I work for a, a legal charity, but this really is a political issue. This really does require political pushback um, because, you know, at the end of the day, the province can amend laws to make them more favorable to, you know, what they want to do. 
and uh, what they what they need to feel is not just you know a, a court setting aside one particular decision or um, you know getting a little bit of blowback on 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 something because the the court makes some adverse commentary about what they're doing. I mean, we've seen this government be fairly impervious to those kinds of uh, decisions that you know another government might be ashamed of or deeply embarrassed by right so um yes there are court cases yes we're we're looking at every possible opportunity to to uh address things using legal tools but but I, I, people really need to put their eggs in that political basket and and keep that political pressure on because without that you know, there, there's, there still is no bottom, right? I mean, courts can only enforce and apply the laws that exist and you have a majority government and they can change those laws. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question here, cheat sheets and info for letter writing, et cetera. Uh, could a cheat sheet and or draft letter to the government player at cheat sheet request the federal, provincial, municipal levels be made available for residents to use and adapt and send? Are there fact sheets about the role of the federal government as outlined by Laura that we can use in writing our federal MPs? Could we get succinct notes on the federal jurisdiction, for example, Department of Fisheries? Informed comments would be useful when making phone calls. Bill, I think you have some of this set up already in environmental defense. Yes. So, it, so I'm, go to Laura. Yeah, I'm going to put this uh, in. Uh in the chat i don't know how to speak to everybody but perhaps you guys can share it on i have a link that i've added to the chat if you type in hands off the green belt action it doesn't just deal with the green belt it, it also deal it's called that but it deals with all of the other changes that we're pushing back on as well it will give you as a starter a draft letter to uh the uh, Premier and to your MVP who is right here with us, uh, thank you, uh, but calling on them to do stuff. But then once you do that, you will get the opportunity to do the next step. So we'll give you the whole chain of actions that you can take. And when we start to do the push to a federal uh, MPPs, we will have a draft letter for you, at, or sorry, to federal MPs, we'll have a draft letter for you there. So if you go to hands off the green belt action, environmental defense, if you just Google that, or if you follow the link that I, I've posted and hopefully Elaine will, will repost for folks, uh, then uh, you will be able to get everything that you're asking for. Okay, thank you. Laura, do you? Um, I, do, I don't have a federal jurisdiction cheat sheet for land use planning in Ontario in my back pocket, unfortunately, but I mean, it really is just as simple as communicating that you expect them to protect fisheries, species at risk, and migratory birds, um, and to environmentally assess projects that environmental defense and others are asking them to, to do that for. So um, you'll see things rolling out if you if you follow the yours to protect and hands off the green belt um, materials at environmental defense and um, you know eco justice working with environmental defense to try and move forward some of those issues so i'm going to go to one last question before we go wrap to wrap up what power do the municipalities affected actually have to not provide supportive development in terms of services such as water sewage gas etc i understand that some have been explicit about the costs and additional tax burden that would be required laura did you want to speak to that first um yeah, so I mean, the additional tax burden from that servicing is going to be exorbitant. Um, so, so you know, I think they the affected municipalities. Um, it's their project, right? Like, typically, it's the regional governments who who actually build the servicing and they've relied historically on development charges to pay for that infrastructure. Um, in, in some of these cases, it's now going to be put down, uh, 
you know, the, the planning authority for that will no longer be with the regional government. So they won't even get a say in where they're putting that infrastructure through the, the exercise of planning jurisdiction. They're just gonna be asked to build it wherever at whatever expense. And that is going to be a huge problem. And, um, but, it, but it's their projects, right? I mean, a, an individual developer can't go around expropriating land to build a sewer or tearing up roads or um, you know, get water servicing from, from a lake you know, far away. So they need the municipalities to agree to build that servicing. Yeah. So Otherwise I, they cannot build their projects. So I think this is what it means. It's not actually you know, some weird loophole that needs to be exploited, right? Municipalities need to be active participants. Like they have capital plans, they build sewage treatment plants. You know, these are not, things really that the provincial government does, but all they really need to do is just not do those things. And changes to zoning do not make those things happen, right? You know, if the, the developers can win all the zoning battles they want, it's not going to get, you know, uh, sewer mains built that will connect to this. And it's especially true for the greenbelt pieces, because this is not a matter of the developer simply tapping in to something that's right next to where they are. Like it might be easier, like there might be some weird, I don't know what exactly the mechanism would be, but some way to get them to compel the municipality to let them build pipes and hook up to them. But it's not even physically possible for uh, the Greenbelt land that's being proposed for removal in the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve. There's a whole area that's just completely undeveloped uh, land uh, in between the, the existing sewage systems and the land that's being built. Someone has to build the pipe. So the municipality just needs to not do that. Thank you. Yeah. And, and with that, I'm going to go to wrap up comments. And now if I'm going to start with you, uh, you've got about a minute, minute and a half. Okay. What I want to leave everyone with is the fact that if we don't oppose this, soon we will lose the entire green belt and every other piece of protected land in our nation. This will be disastrous for preventing climate change as the green belt alone has enough plants to offset 71 megatons of carbon dioxide each year, which for those of you that don't know is half of Ontario's emissions. We need more plants to offset our emissions. We don't need to be removing our forests or farmland. We are mere decades away from the disasters of the millennia with great floods, massive forest fires, desert, more deserts and mass migrations on the way. Some of us are already feeling it if you're in BC or, or Pakistan. It is now or never to fight climate change. Every country, every, every government, every person needs to act. It is time we protect our plants. If we let Bill 23 stand, we will soon lose all our protected land. So please attend every rally, sign every petition, scare the conservatives. Let everyone know of your rage, because that is the only way we can protect our future. Thank you. Anna, thank you very much. Laura, your last words. Um, yeah, I just, you know, I think it's great to support organizations like ours that are, are bringing legal actions, but keep that political pressure on, keep it on all three levels of government. Let them know you're noticing, let them know that you know they don't have to build the sewer and the water infrastructure that you can't, that the municipalities can't be forced to. Let the feds know that you know they could stop the destruction of, of wetlands in the green belt. Let them know. Um, and you know, let the conservative MPPs and your other MPPs know that this is an issue you are not going to forget about in three or four years. Laura, thank you very much. Bill. Yeah. Um, what Laura said, but actually, you know, just <laughs> please lean on your federal MPP uh, or your federal MP uh, to use the federal jurisdiction. Uh, to not uh, to not allow the provincial government to develop the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve. Tell them straight out, you know it's their jurisdiction, they can do it, you're expecting them to do it. Thank you very much. I, I'd like to thank my three panelists this evening, 
you were fabulous. Uh, and I think people will really enjoy uh, looking at the video of this meeting when it gets posted. I wanted to remind everyone out there that there will be a demonstration Monday at noon at 123 Queen West, the Sheraton Center, uh, against the attack on the Greenbelt. We'll be sending out information to everyone who registered for tonight's meeting, along with uh, the link that Phil had provided for information on how to contact MPs and MPPs. Uh, I wanted to thank my three staff, Elaine, Rob, and Louise, for all the work they did making this possible this evening. Uh, they worked hard, folks. They worked very hard. And I'd like to thank everyone who participated. Uh, this is a critical issue. It's going to be a long-term fight. Enough is right. Uh, if we lose this, all the rest is going to be taken as well. So we can't afford to simply let this pass. We have to fight very hard. And frankly, we have to stall them till closer to the next election so it becomes a major election issue, one that will scare them profoundly. So without that, thank you all for being part of this meeting this evening. I wish you well. Look forward to seeing you on Monday at the demonstration. Good night. Thank you so much.